Hi, I'm Bob Brown, Mayor of the City of Lufkin, and welcome to the Pines Theater. We have a documentary about the history and the renovation of this theater, and we hope you enjoy it. wonderful people out there in the dark. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. He's looking at you, kid. Hey, Stella! Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. <laughs> what we've got here is... Failure to communicate. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinderella Starry, out of nowhere, a former greenskeeper now about to become the Masters champion. <clears throat> it looks like I'm a wreck. It's in the hole! remember them, those famous scenes, those famous quotes, so much so we tend to weave them into our daily conversations. These scenes created memorable moments that were shared by everyone, but for many of us, they weren't just shared anywhere. They were shared right here in the Pines Theater. During its heyday, this cultural landmark was part of Lufkin's way of life. The whole movie experience at the Pines was more than just buying a ticket and getting a bag of popcorn. The Pines was the meeting place for many, a place to meet your pals, a place to meet that special someone, or a place to escape daily life. For those two hours in the dark, everyone there became a community of individuals who will recall the very same moment in this very theater. And now it's back. Other generations get the opportunity to create their own community, experiencing the specialness of the Pines Theater and those good time moments that they will carry with them throughout the rest of their lives. The Pines Theater is here for the enjoyment of the whole Lufkin community, bringing a multitude of live entertainment and films. It wasn't an easy undertaking, but it was well worth it. Nineteen twenty-five. Texas, along with the rest of the nation, was in the middle of the Roaring Twenties. New discoveries, new inventions, increased manufacturing. Business was booming. In the South, the theme for the Twenties was economic expansion. For Texas, it was oil. Lufkin also felt the roar. Downtown was the center of activity, and that's where everyone wanted to be. Downtown was ground zero for the city's entertainment, and at the Epic Center was the Pines Theater. The grand opening of the Pines was on September 9, 1925. It was first owned by the Lufkin Amusement Company, which later became East Texas Theaters. On that day, moviegoers were treated to the theater's first movie, Coast of Folly, starring Gloria Swanson. Organ music was provided by Willie Frazier, who also sold the tickets. An average cost for a movie was about 25 cents. 
Patrons came to the Pines to see Chaplin, Valentino, and Pickford. And a little known mouse named Mickey appeared on the scene. From the beginning, the theater played the silent movies of the times. By the late 20s, talkies were introduced and Hollywood was churning out an average of 800 films annually. Throughout the 30s and 40s, the Pines brought the stars to Lufkin. Gene Harlow, Greta Garbo, Clark Gable, and big name movies like All's Quiet on the Western Front, 42nd Street, and of course, Gone with the Wind. Everyone has movies they remember. I remember some of the shows, you know, Giant and Gone with the Wind. I remember getting to go by myself without, without my mom or without a friend's mom. It was a group of us went and they were playing the, the Jungle Book. I remember High Noon. You can remember Cleopatra, some of the other bigger movies that came to town. You, you go, Music Man, I remember one of those. The, the Gene Kelly, the fun, the musicals with the pretty, pretty girls in the costumes and Doris Day and Esther Williams. Everyone remembers the blob. Every one of you watching this screen, look out. Because soon, very soon, the most horrifying monster menace ever conceived will be oozing into this theater. When they showed the scene of the blob running throughout the theater here in Lufkin, Texas, they did it with such effect and it was in color that about half the theater got up and ran for the doors. During the 40s and 50s, patrons could spend a night or an afternoon at the movies for just a little under a dollar. Three nights I would sell tickets, and then one night I would be in the concession, and tickets were like 35 cents for adults and nine cents for children. I think popcorn was a 25 cents, and drinks were a dime, and candy was a nickel or a dime. In the later years of the Pines Theater, it provided a Saturday of fun for Lufkin children and its weekly kitty shows. Everybody gathered out front before the movie, so you got to see all your friends, especially those that lived across town. Uh, they always had a cereal every morning. You know, it could be Flash Gordon or a Western cereal or whatever. And obviously that was a good draw because the, the ser you had to come the next Saturday to get the next chapter in the cereal that morning. What's up, Jack? And then after that they showed cartoons. And I remember the Bugs Bunny one and the Road Runner. And then the, the main movie, uh, usually a Western, they were usually Roy Rogers or, or uh, uh, you know, the, the typical uh, heroes that were back in those days. Lashing the roof, he kept a whip. And uh, that, was one, that was one of my favorite characters at that time. I remember a couple of Tarzan movies, and, but the, the kiddie show movies were targeted strictly for the kids. But I'd give away prizes at that kid show. All kinds of prizes I'd give away. I'd give away passes, I'd give away uh, just about anything I'd get a hold of. We'd go to the movie a lot of times just by ourselves, knowing our friends would be there, ride my bicycle, whatever. There were more friendships made at the Saturday morning kitty show across the city than any other venue that was offered at the time. I also remember as a child being thrown out of the Saturday kitty show at the Pines Theater because my best friend General Michael Taylor, who wasn't a general at that time, was throwing spit wads and got both of us tossed out of the Saturday morning kitty show. Well, I would probably argue with Phil's memory about that topic, but uh, uh, some of us would, as I mentioned, once sometimes your, uh, your decision was whether to go to Perry Brothers and, and, and get something, whatever it may be, and from time to time that happened to be a, uh, a pea shooter. You could get a, a straw and a bag of peas for you know a dime or whatever, and that was probably the most dangerous thing that happened because you could probably hit someone in the eye, but uh, you know, Medford, you gotta, you gotta take, the, take the source of that deal. It could have been the other way around as well. Put, man, I put a bunch of them out in the show. I didn't mess with them. I, w I would be nice to them till they wouldn't mam it, and I'd just tell them to get gone. 
I babysit a lot of them on Saturday mornings down there, the mother going shopping somewhere. <laughs> but they they learned how to be a babysitter in town. On Saturdays, you could take a dollar, get full, stay cool, and watch a movie. On the weekend, the theater catered to the teens and young adults of Lufkin by offering a special Saturday midnight movie event. Yeah, the midnight showings were a big deal. To One, to stay up that late, and then to get to go to the midnight show. And a lot of times they would be some 1950s horror flick, you know, probably being shown today somewhere in, a, in a, some kind of camp theater that says, these are great. Lady was telling me last night that she went to the midnight show and she couldn't remember what was the name of the movie. But when it was a scary part, they had something underneath your seat and it would vibrate your seat. As far as the midnight, mm -mm. my mother wouldn't let me go. You know, the, the radio went off at 11 o'clock. A big part of the movie going experience was the hype that was built around the features. Promotion of the featured films was common in most theaters and managers tried every trick in the book to get the attention of the paying public. Bonnie and Clyde, we played that picture, had, an old, had their old car out there shot at. Had that thing on display out in front of the theater and I've had horses on display out there and caves. And, Man, you name it, we've done it. <laughs> you know, it created the tension uh, right downtown there. It's been a hard day's night. When the Beatles' first movie, A Hard Day's Night, was scheduled to play at the Pines, dedicated Lufkin fans camped out to be the first to get tickets. I was dressed up in a mini skirt, go go boots, long straight hair, and there were we lined up in front all the way down 1st Street and turned. Down the other street and back up the other street and back up there again to the theater. All the way around that block with kids in line to come in there. The, that many people were waiting to go in to see the Beatles' first movie. And that's when I fell in love with the Beatles. Approximately 300 tickets were sold in about 10 minutes. Up in the projection room, two peerless brand projectors were monitored non-stop by the projectionist. And you had to have two projectors because, you, you know, your film was only about 30 minutes per, per roll. The first thing you did was get the number two projector loaded and ready and make sure you had a new carbon in it. Because if the carbon runs out in the middle of the movie, you're going to hear this Hey, 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 wake up, wake up, and stuff, you know. But these are the carbon projector rods that we used in, uh, in, the, uh, in the projectors. And you kept, you know, you start off with about a half inch gap. And, you know, to start it, you bump the rods together and then pull them apart. And this produced a really, really strong light, just like a welding machine. And they, through the lenses, they projected through the film media right on out through the lenses to the, to the screen. And I never understood that, but when I was a kid growing up, you'd be watching a movie and you'd see the, the, the film, you'd see the screen sort of look like it was wrinkling and it was what it was was the heat from the, the rod melting the, uh, the uh, film itself. You couldn't leave the room, so that's why we had the bathroom in the corner. And it really wasn't a bathroom, it was just a John with a laboratory. Because the minute you did, something would happen. One of the carbons would break or something like that. And, and you know, overall, that was pretty doggone good projection system. It was extremely bright and, and it worked really well. Let's all go to the lobby. The movie experience was not complete without a visit to the concession stand in the lobby for your favorite movie snack and beverage. Uh, there was a glass case, sell the candies, and mostly it was all chocolate. But some, I know some would buy uh, popcorn and junior mints. Your decision was usually whether to get a Coke and some popcorn, I believe would cost you a quarter to a total for those two, 
or uh, if you're going to get an all-day uh, sucker or some sugar babies. Uh, those were kind of the decisions that, that I went through, but everybody kind of did it the same way. And But having that big glass candy uh, display case there that you know, from a hygiene standpoint, probably wasn't very good because I'd put my hands and nose up against it and just look at all the different candies that were there that I could pick from. Not everyone liked what was being shown at the theater. In 1962, Reverend John Caskey of St. Cyprian's Episcopal Church launched a formal protest against the showing of the movie Lolita. He stood outside the theater and monitored the age groups who attended. That was a big deal in Lufkin. Let's face it, that was a big deal. And I looked over and in the midst of the crowd was Father John Caskey in his complete rector's, the long black coat and the white collar. Father Caskey had this sign that says like, no Lolita in Lufkin. But it always stuck in my mind that uh, we have our own ways of keeping that good East Texas value in place, even if it's a one-man show, because I don't think anyone else showed up to pick it with him. Because it was located in the Central Business District, it was occasionally used as an auditorium for special events. Miss Lufkin pageants were held at the Pines Theater. I know of three that were held because I was at them. Early in the fall of 1929, a mystery wedding was scheduled to take place at the Pines Theater. Hundreds of people waited at the theater. At 8 p.m., parting curtains revealed the wedding scene, followed by the ceremony uniting the mystery couple, Mr. Thurman Otto McKinney and Miss Mary Faye Smith. At the time of President Kennedy's assassination, the Pines Theater became a place of a memorial. Approximately 150 people attended the service. The Pines attempted to cater to the whole family by providing crying rooms for those with young or cranky children who just didn't care what was up on the screen. Upstairs, there was a great big room with a, a window about like this and some nice chairs and uh, baby, baby beds. I guess that helped kept out the sound too, also the baby's crying. And you could still watch the movie. Up until 1964, the United States practiced racial segregation. In Lufkin, the Pines Theater complied with the practice by isolating its balcony so that those in Lufkin affected by segregation could also attend the movies. It only had one staircase that took you to the balcony, and the entrance to that was, was at the front of the building, uh, behind the ticket booth. We were not allowed to go in the bottom part of the pines, but we was allowed. They built a special door and a special place to buy your tickets and build a, a upstairs for us. That's tremendous for us to remember what happened then. And you know, everybody who studies history, you know, you study history so you don't repeat the failures of the past and you learn from those and you move on. But that was a very thing that hit at the heart of Lufkin and we needed to try to maintain and preserve that in some way. As other downtown theaters closed and new multi-theaters were being built in Lufkin, the Pines continued on. In 1981, the Pines' last manager, Ray Pike, had the facility refurbished. Throughout its life, the theater was the city's entertainment center, a landmark where thousands of people from the area spent an afternoon together, chasing bad guys with Roy Rogers, experiencing epics like Gone with the Wind and Giant, or watching out for a great white shark. Although there were other theaters in the downtown district, the Pines was the place to be. And there was no mall in Lufkin. There was, there was just very little in the way of entertainment. And the theater, the movie theater, provided that. I remember as a young boy, I was probably about 10 or 11, going to one of the Pink Panther movies there. And I really just can't tell you much about the movie itself. I just you know, can't remember much about it. But I do remember distinctly when we left the movie. Uh, in downtown at that time, they had these small red light uh, signals that were located on the corner. And they were just a short yellow pole, probably, you know, 10 feet high, that, that we had red lights on every corner, unlike today where we have stop signs. And my dad was behind somebody at the red light and that person took off and my dad followed him and the right light was still red. 
So he got his very first ticket in his life, and he was probably in his late 50s at that time at uh, Leaving the Pines at a Pink Panther movie. And the reason that she was unconscious was that she had received a bump upon the head. A what? A bump. A gathering place. It was a place where you got to know everybody. You get to see different people. You get to meet different girls. You get to meet different people like that. And we was too young to really court, but we would always go to the movies and try to sit close to some girl that we liked. Whether she knew it or not, but we'd be trying to sit close to her. Uh, we just kind of sat in the box office when it was not busy. We knew every good looking boy's car number. We didn't know their name, but we knew their license number. Fun thing that a friend and I did. We went on a double date to the, to the movie, to the Pines. During an intermission, she and I went to the ladies' restroom, completely swapped all of our clothes. She put on my clothes, and I put on her clothes. We went back and joined the guys, and they never even noticed. Ray and I had our first date, at, I don't remember the name of the movie, at the Pines Theater in October of 59. Four years later, we were married in 60, June of 63. I would pay my brother to go sit on the front row because we would meet in the movie. We couldn't drive, and we would meet, and that way he wouldn't spy on me if he was on the front row. And he holds that over my head today, that I hurt his neck by making him sit on the front row during all the movies. It had a very strong social connection for all of the teens and preteens in Lufkin that, that really spanned quite a, an age diversity. There are a lot of older people today, older than I, if you can believe it, that I met at that venue that I still know today. Sometime in the mid 80s, the Pines Curtains closed on its last movie. Elliot Cavanaugh sold the Pines back in 1984, and the Pines' last activity was a house of worship for the Covenant of Love outreach. The theater was listed on the National Registry of Historic Places in 1988 and continued on as a church until approximately 2005. Silent, dark, in disrepair, it remained vacant until 2007 when the city of Lufkin stepped in and purchased the theater. One of the areas that really glared out after we did the improvements was the fact that the Old Pines Theater, at that time the roof was deteriorated, it was full of water. The appearance in the downtown area was very, very deplorable when you looked at the Pines and there was a lot of historic reference that people wanted to maintain the, the Pines because there were so many memories of people that grew up, that being the number one area of recreation in Lufkin. But that central business district is really the heart of our city. And when people come to Lufkin, sooner or later they're coming downtown. And the way that looks, the, the feel they get when they drive through there, stop, whatever their business is, carries a lot of weight on what they think of our community. The first vision that popped in my mind was, what happens if we have to tear that part of the history down and leave that hole right in the middle of First Street. I think initially we looked at it, you know, you, you don't want it to go away and you don't know if it's going to be a, a city facility or you're going to shore it up in the hopes that you have a private investor one day uh, want to do that. But I think we were charged with let's try to save it, let's, let's do the roof, let's stop it from leaking, let's, you know, make the water go away that's standing in there and secure the building and then consider what our options were. And there were many options at the time and ultimately I think it kind of fell to us as far as civic responsibility that we would take that over, make the investment, and uh, truly be a partner in restoring downtown. Melvin Kirsch established a foundation called the Piney Woods Foundation. We try to preserve history. Me being one of the youngest ones on that uh, foundation still remembered those days of, uh, of the Pines Theater and what it was like and, and how much of a part of downtown that it was. It was easy for us to sit down and discuss this and recognize that, 
you're doing a couple of things. Number one, I think we're reinvigorating, help reinvigorating downtown, but also preserving a piece of history that if it were not for the city stepping up and doing this, uh, will probably get lost. As with any other project, you have to start at the beginning. This included that very first visit to the dark, silent theater. When I first walked into the pines, the mold smell would knock you out. It was wet, it had a swimming pool in the middle for catching water, and I was thinking, oh my God, what are we gonna do? It was like going into a haunted house, it was scary. You know, you walk in with a flashlight, and it was dark, it was dank, it was moist. The first order of business was getting the water out. So we end up getting the, uh, a truck over there and a pump and pumping the, the pines out. Because then after that, we determined that there was a uh, pit back in the mechanical room and there was a pump underneath there that was supposed to be running. So we ended up putting a new, uh, new pump in and, and pump the water down. Clean the building up, get all the debris and the junk that was scattered in the building out. Then when we noticed when it rained, the entire ceiling was uh, leaking. So the, then the next order of business was to repair the ceiling. Number two, let's, let's do the outside, the exterior. Somebody was driving down the street and hit the marquee. It, it tore off the cover of the marquee, but behind the cover was some pretty heavy duty steel. So it didn't really do any damage structurally, but it, it definitely did it as far as fit, you know, appearance. And, and at the same time we were doing this, we were doing some sidewalk stuff downtown. So we designed the sidewalk to keep the marquee from being damaged again, uh, pull it, put up the bollards, the lighted bollards to, to kind of protect the marquee once it was repaired. The big question was what are we going to make the marquee look like? Because what we did is we had pulled, we knew what it looked like back when I guess in the 40s, 30s and 40s, but inside when we were digging around we found some, some concrete arches or brick arches from the inside. Originally this was an open glassed area and this would have been open down to the lobby where light would have shined in, natural light would have shined in. And right here, the arches, you can see the, the limestone uh, keyways that would have matched the arches that are inside the interior of the building. And you can still see two sets of those that are existing today. So the, there was a big debate on do we take it back to what it was originally or do we take it back to what basically all the council members and the mayor and so forth remembered when they were kids. And it's at that point we had a citizens committee that worked with the staff to uh, try and determine the uh, potential usage of the pines. Uh, we did a survey of the citizens through a survey instrument on our internet and got input from the citizens on uh, what they thought the Pines Theater could be reutilized for. From that point on we just looked at the best utilization of the space and trying to keep the historical portion of the uh, theater. As demolition and reconstruction continued through 2010 and 2011, the Pines Theater's true unique identity and heritage began to appear. Uh, this area of the wall was all covered up with uh, acoustic type material. And you can see it, the, the wall with the arches. And these areas at the base were white keystones. There were white keystones at the bottom of the arches. And at the very tip of the arch, there was a white keystone in this area also that matched the front of the building as far as the uh, limestone keystone area in the, in the arches. The city had many discussions and planning sessions to help decide as to how the old theater should be reconstructed. It was decided to bring her back to her heydays of the 40s and 50s but with state-of-the-art equipment and safety features. One of the big concerns we had was historical. I mean, that was that was what I was looking at. You know, we, we brought it back to the, the facade. You know, that exterior marquee look look uh, historical, and and that's what I was hoping to do inside the pines is not hide a bunch of the architecture with with tapestry. Once we got the floor on, we put in a scaffolding, and the scaffolding was put in to to work on the ceilings, to put in this the sprinkler systems, the sound system, all the wiring, the the IT, all the fibers, and so forth so you couldn't have to work off a ladder. We just scaffold the entire building. The sound system is going to be a digital, state-of-the-art sound system. There'll be uh, sound from the front all the way to the back of the building, so if you have a seat all the way back into the balcony area, 
you're going to enjoy the sound as well as the person on the front seat. The stage has been uh, increased, enlarged, because we're, we're foreseeing different types of functions. We've already been contacted about doing a wedding in the, in the theater. We're excited about that, you know, the public being able to utilize the facility and in different ways that we may not even have imagined yet. We went back and we've placed some light bars with modern lighting, LED type lighting that uh, should facilitate most shows that we have. Projectors will hang from the ceiling and because of the size of the screen we couldn't do it with one projector. We had to stack projectors to get the intensity of light and be able to uh, fill up that screen. We're anticipating uh, the uh, old projector room itself to be more of a display of how the movie theater used to work. We hope to have uh, the the projectors totally renovated as far as uh, the appearance. Of it. They won't be functional, but the appearance, and we do have uh, old film and reels that we captured from it. It won't actually be a museum, but it'll have the appearance as you walk by and look at it that it was an active old theater from the 1960 era. I think that a great deal of thought, planning, discussions community-wide have gone into the Pines Theater and I think because of that we'll have a very strong, solid anchor for the downtown area that will be a tourist attraction. And I think there's a tipping point at which you have to say, I'm willing as a city to protect what my forefathers built and what is integral to the part in the hearts of people in Lufkin. I think that was the hope that this could be a venue for artists, performing artists, um, whether it's theater or, or music, to again improve the quality of life and offer something to all the citizens. If you, if you had to think about you know, that building, it's kind of a keystone building that has been here for a very long time that kind of anchors the downtown area. You're talking about economic restructuring, you're talking about tourism, you're talking about all of those things. We have built our downtown up, or we're building it up. With the Pines Theater, it's gonna be like icing on the cake. The community should get behind it and support it. I know we spend a lot of money on different things, but art is, is, is one thing that we should never do away with. It's so easy to bulldoze things over. But the guy running the bulldozer could not recreate the work of art that he is destroying. The city has to think about the future and therefore they have to think about the kids that are here now. We think about the people that are already here and been here a long time, and we have to connect all these together, making all the generations understand this is our city, this is what we had, this is what we have, and this is going to be our future. When you save a historic piece of a downtown, um, then you bring back the life and you bring back the history of what built your community. But my hope is that totally new generations will now be able to build their own memories with the Pines Theater. And I think we'll be able to look back one day and say, man, it all started with bringing that Pines Theater back and, and ultimately the hotel and all these others. And We're going to have a vibrant downtown again. I really think that that's going to happen. With the creativity of the minds of our, our citizens of Lufkin, we can have a, a tremendous asset in the downtown area.